All right, I think that's it for new uh, participants. So I think we're good to get started. So I'll uh, hand it over to you, Katie. Great, thanks Mason. Um, and hello everybody, good afternoon and evening. I'm super excited to be here um, with the Build a CubeSat Challenge class. My name is Katie Piccioni. Uh, I actually have a little introductory slide here. Um, I'm uh, an employee at MIT Lincoln Laboratory. I work in the Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Relief Systems Group. Um, before coming to Lincoln Lab, I worked at FEMA for a couple years, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, where I was working on uh, using remote sensing and overhead imagery in disaster response. Um, I have an undergraduate degree from WPI in mechanical engineering and society technology and policy, and my master's in, is in technology and policy. Um, and overall, like my, uh, my interests are really on what, what we like to think of as like socio-technical systems. So the intersection of you know, technical systems and society policy. Um, and so, so I was uh, really honored when, when Rebecca and Mason and Anch asked if I would provide um, some content on like on, on a mission for the CubeSats. Uh, over the last few years, I've been working on uh, better understanding satellite remote sensing in disaster response, where we can be using satellite remote sensing more effectively during disasters, and, um, and, and why we aren't using satellite remote sensing particularly effectively right now, um, which I, I think I'll, I'll maybe start on uh, clarifying that point a little bit. Um, so just to kind of frame this, this discussion, uh, satellite remote sensing and disasters, what is it? Well, we're, we're talking about overhead imagery uh, and satellite remote sensing and the way that that imagery can, could, is, and, and could better be used in disasters. Um, and so disasters are, are usually described as serious disruptions to the functioning of a community that exceeds that community's capacity to cope using its own resources. This is a definition from the International Federation of the Red Cross. And I think when we think of disasters, right, we think of, um, you know, uh, disruptions caused by natural hazards, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, earthquakes. Um, disasters are can also be man-made, of course, and caused by humans, um, uh, terrorist attacks, or sometimes just the breakdown of infrastructure like nuclear reactors can lead to a disruption like this, where, um, you know, we have to things get damaged and we have to repair power lines and, and, and um, road networks and you know, rebuild homes and uh, restore you know, kind of the normal functioning of society. And so emergency management, which um, I think is this term that's often used sort of interchangeably with disasters, and I, I use them interchangeably sometimes, um, but emergency management is the like the, the function or the practice of uh, responding to, recovering from, and uh, creating resilience to prevent the disruption of disasters in the future. And so, um, you know, this uh, definition from the Emergency Management Institute really talks about creating frameworks within which we reduce vulnerabilities um, and manage incidents when they occur. And so, starting with this kind of, um, you know, this this foundation, you know, we can talk about some of the functions that emergency managers typically perform. Uh, emergency managers will issue evacuation orders and people who are in a disaster, an area that may be affected by a natural hazard um, have to kind of decide whether to evacuate. Emergency managers provide food, water, shelter, medical services, and other emergency services to disaster survivors when an, an, when an incident occurs. Um, search and rescue, right? Restoring and rebuilding bridges, power lines, um, wastewater treatment plants, uh, communication system, telecom systems, um, these and many other functions are, are involved in restoring critical infrastructure when a disaster happens. Um, and emergency management activities also include removing debris and repairing homes. Um, and so, you know, looking at these activities, um, they take place sort of at different times as a disaster unfolds. And we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, a little bit later in the presentation. But I wanted to kind of frame why are we, you know, why are we talking about using remote sensing in disasters in the first place? What can this do for us, and why is it important? And um, what, one of the reasons that I think it's important is that uh, both domestically and internationally, we have pretty robust uh, disaster response and and recovery 
systems, um, you know, human systems. But disasters are becoming more frequent um, in the United States alone. Uh, so this this is a data. What we're looking at here is a data set that is collected and curated by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Um, and they track the frequency of billion dollar disasters in the United States. And so this, I, this actually was, uh, I prepared this almost a year ago, or yeah, almost a year ago. And so the 2023 number is much higher now. Um, but what we're seeing is that like between when FEMA, our domestic agency that manages disasters, between when it was formed in 1979 and when the Department of Homeland Security was formed in 2003, which was sort of a pivotal point in, the, in FEMA's history, um, the nation was experiencing about $4 billion disasters a year. And now we're experiencing like $1 to $2 billion disasters a month. Um, and, you know, this formative period is really when, when we established a lot of the um, processes and programs that emergency managers use to respond to, recover from, and, and mitigate uh, disasters and emergencies. Um, and so the what, what I see when I look at this data is that our systems really weren't designed for the frequency and severity of disasters we're experiencing today. Um, and so we need to be doing things differently. And technology in general is one of the ways that that can help. Uh, remote sensing in particular can help help emergency managers get a better sense of what is going on in the immediate aftermath of a disaster um, and also provide important information during recovery. Uh, what we're seeing here is what is widely regarded as the first overhead image of a disaster. This was taken, um, uh, so this is a photograph that was taken shortly after the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. And uh, the, the, the photographer actually um, mounted a, a camera on a kite, and this was a, you know, a kite, kite photography um, photograph, but it was the first time that we were able to see from above um, like how widespread damage was and what kind of damage was sustained. And today, of course, we have, um, you know, we, we have aerial systems, UAVs and satellites that are providing overhead imagery that we can use during disaster response. And to, today's remote sensing systems reveal damage, flood extents, power outages, area burned by wildfires, um, and, and many other uh, pieces of information about what disasters have, the damage that disasters have caused uh, and, and the area that they've affected. Um, but what we're seeing also today is that, like, is that these, uh, you know, while these systems exist, they're really underutilized in domestic emergency management in particular. Um, it's one thing to kind of be able to look at this wide area overview of an of okay, so we can see kind of all of the areas that were impacted by a flood, perhaps, or impacted by power outages. But a lot of these emergency management functions that I started talking about at the beginning um, are really specific to location, and they happen on a very short time frame. Um, and so, as I suspect you've learned a little bit about uh, satellite, satellite operations over the course of this class, I'll talk a little bit about it in more detail. But um, in general, satellite satellite remote sensing is sort of underutilized uh, due to timeliness and, and resolution restrictions. And so we'll talk more about that. Um, but in general, satellites offer a persistent uh, global wide area coverage view of the Earth. And so this is why um, you know, while drones and aircraft are also very useful during disasters, satellites provide a unique view um, because they're able to operate in environments where you can't send crews out on the ground necessarily. They can collect repeat passes to show change over time and show how either disaster recovery might be progressing or how the impacts of a disaster continue to unfold. Um, one of the things that's really valuable about satellite imagery is that the products that one might generate from satellite data are fairly consistent um, with drones in particular. Like you, there's a wide variety of different kinds of imagery and analytic products that UAVs uh, and UAV operators can produce. Some of that is due to the very wide variability um, of the UAVs themselves, um, but also the way that they're operated, the way the data can be, can be processed. Um, and then what I think is one of the, actually the most promising and uh, perhaps underappreciated <laughs> aspects of satellite remote sensing and disasters is that they can be used to take images of areas that are, you know, widely impacted, 
um, that are remote and that are maybe less urgent or less exigent than some of the disasters we're familiar with. Um, on this last slide, I had a picture here of the, this was the, um, this is a satellite image that was taken of damage uh, after the earthquake in Turkey last year. And that was a really serious incident. Um, it was widespread, caused a lot of damage. And so uh, a lot of different response organizations were operating in the area, collecting data, collecting overhead imagery, um, and, and disseminating those products. But there are also um, wide area flooding incidents that happen, uh, tornadoes or windstorms or other severe storms that are fairly localized. Um, even something like a regional power outage can cause cascading impacts affecting infrastructure. Um, and and for these incidents that are a little bit more localized, we often don't collect any overhead imagery at all. Um, and so, so satellites, you know, because they are in space and persistently available, uh, they they really could be better utilized in a lot of these smaller incidents. Um, and so while we're we are doing better in using satellite remote sensing, especially in responding to more significant and severe incidents, um, there really is a, a great need. I think on average. Uh, we, the world, uh, somewhere in the world, there is uh, an average of like one and a half to two disasters every single day. Um, and so remote sensing can play a huge role in enabling emergency managers to respond to and recover from those incidents more quickly. Uh, and so this really begs the question at the bottom here, right? Like how can and how should we design and operate satellites and satellite remote sensing systems to meet the needs of emergency managers for disaster response? Um, and so that's what I'm going to talk about in the rest of this presentation. Uh, and I'm going to start with just giving a little bit more technical detail on um, on remote sensing or what we sometimes call Earth observation. Uh, in general, there's a like this seven step Earth observation process, um, and it starts with having an energy source. So um, th there really are two two classifications of remote sensing, active remote sensing and passive remote sensing um, and passive remote sensing uses light that's produced by usually the sun um, and you know that light goes through the atmosphere uh, reflects off of whatever is on the ground and those reflections are uh, the that reflected light is detected by usually an optical sensor or an infrared sensor um, mounted on a satellite in space that data gets downlinked to a ground station um, uploaded and processed and analyzed in your in a computer and then published and disseminated on the internet um, so this is a pretty typical process for active remote sensing for active remote sensing processes um, the the energy source would also be the satellite um, and so that would include synthetic aperture radar um, and lidar are the two the two main sensing modalities i'll talk a little bit about sar in a, in a bit um at, at a very fundamental process <laughs> the very fundamentals uh, remote sensing is based on electromagnetic radiation. And so I suspect some of you might have talked about electromagnetic waves in, in your classes, um, but uh, electromagnetic waves are like basically energy traveling through space. And um, they are waves that have um, an electric field and a magnetic field that are orthogonal or you know, perpendicular to each other. Um, and that, and for which the the magnitude of those of those fields is oscillating um, through space and time. And so um, the one of the main properties of electromagnetic waves is their wavelength or frequency, which are inversely proportional. Wavelength is how far apart the peaks and troughs of these of these waves are, um, or of the oscillations are. And frequency is how many oscillations you have per uh, unit time. And so um, the reason that this is important is because electromagnetic waves of different wavelengths or different frequencies behave very differently. Um, and so this is just a, a rendering of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. Um, you know, visible light is uh, is one of one type of electromagnetic electromagnetic radiation. Um, radio waves and microwaves, infrared, all the way up to, to gamma rays with the, the highest frequency. Um, and we'll be talking mostly about visible light and microwave radiation in this talk. Uh, but I think like one, the point here is that these are all, um, it's all part of the same, it's all the same thing at the end of the day, even though we detect different types of electromagnetic radiation in very different ways. Um, along with the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, one one um, principle I wanted to make sure I kind of um, shared is that 
the uh, different materials absorb and reflect different frequencies of light. And the atmosphere is one of those things. So there are some, um, some wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation that can pass through the atmosphere and some that, are, that bounce off the atmosphere or are reflected by the atmosphere or absorbed by the atmosphere. Um, and so what we're seeing here is like the atmospheric opacity um, as a function of wavelength. And so we have like the long radio waves down at this end of the spectrum and the you know high frequency gamma rays up at this end of the spectrum, um, and so like one of the reasons we use certain frequencies of electromagnetic radiation for satellite remote sensing is because of the atmospheric opacity. So um, in the middle section here, where there are some uh, some bands that can pass through the atmosphere, we have um, visible light and infrared radiation. Uh, and then this big window down here is the microwave frequency bands. And so we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, these are some of the common uh, some of the common bands that are used. Basically, when we're talking about remote sensing, um, we like to break up this electromagnetic spectrum into chunks. And so rather than just saying that red light is at uh, you know, uh, 600 nanometers, um, we'll give a, a range and, you know, we'll, we'll say that if we're detecting light that we're calling red, it might be between what's on here, 632 and 720 nanometers. Um, and the reason that, and, and uh, up here is an illustration of the wavelengths of some of the microwave, um, the microwave sensing bands that are common. These are some of the uh, optical sensing bands that are commonly used for satellite remote sensing. Um, and the reason we we break these bands up into frequency uh, frequency ranges is because um, basically if you if your sensor is designed to collect multiple frequencies or to detect multiple frequencies of of light, um, you're you're getting more data, uh, and so it it allows us to um, basically have. A, uh, meaningful readings of of, um, of these different uh, different different electromagnetic waves. Um, one of the reason having being able to d differentiate between different different bands is useful is because is because each material or every you know every object on the ground or in the atmosphere reflects and absorbs light differently. So um, when an electromagnetic wave interacts with a substance, in this case, this picture showing a leaf, um, some percentage of, of that light is transmitted or absorbed, and some percentage, you know, some component is reflected. And so based on which, basically, which colors or which bands are absorbed and reflected, we can learn a lot about the material um, and the, the chemical composition of the object. Um, the graph on the side here is showing again, as a function of wavelength, how different colors or different bands of light um, are absorbed by different materials. So uh, the green is vegetation and th this characteristic, um, spectra they're called spectral signatures. This characteristic spe spectral signature is, um, is often used to look at how uh, vegetation is changing over time in a given location. And um, so the, the fact that you know the water reflects more um, of the visible light than vegetation does uh, but it absor you know absorbs all of the near infrared light while um, vegetation is highly reflected in the infrared spectrum um, is like an important spectral signature that we can look for when we when we capture when we break up the energy that's being received by a sensor into these different these different bands um, Talking a little bit more about like sensing modalities and what some different sensing modalities are. Uh, these are terms that you guys might come across um, in, in some of the work that you're doing. Um, this, when we look at like optical imagery and optical sensing, um, often sensors are designed to detect a, some set number of different bands. And so you can have just a RGB camera, which I think is what, what you guys are working with um with the with your sats and that is basically taking you know collecting three different colors um which is also the way our eyes work we see you know we basically see three different colors and then um 
or our, our eyes detect three different colors and then we uh, um, perceive different colors within that based on the, the breakdown of um, how much of each of these is uh, our, our, our eyes are detecting. And that's how an RGB sensor works. Um, there's multispectral imaging, which is where uh, we take the electromagnetic spectrum and break it up into a number of different bands. Often, um, often there will be somewhere between like seven to ten different bands collected by a multispectral signature. Sometimes less, um, but again, this provides uh, uh, the ability to detect spe spectral signatures more clearly. Um, and then hyperspectral imaging, which is becoming more common now. Um, little by little more in aerial uh, aerial collections than satellites um, but increasingly in sat at sat on orbit as well hyperspectral imaging collect can collect hundred you know tens to hundreds of different bands and the way that uh there are really two ways that a uh, um or well the, basically the way that we can take light and break it up into different bands is the same way if you think of white light passing through a prism um, because different wavelengths will be diffracted at different angles, um, the light that passes through a, a prism will, uh, will basically be diffused. And so we can use this principle either, either by passing light through a prism or using something called a diffraction grating, which is like um, if you look at a CD, you know how a CD kind of looks rainbow if you hold it a certain way in the light. Um, it's the same principle. It's basically just the light is reflecting in such a way that the different, the, all of the frequencies that are contained in the white light are reflected at slightly different angles. So they create a rainbow. Um, and so using this same principle, we can divide light up so that um, it's easy, so that a sensor is able to distinguish between different bands. Another sensing modality I wanted to talk about is synthetic aperture radar. Um, I don't know if you've talked about this at all in, in your class, but it's something you might hear about in the future. Uh, and it's a, it's a very powerful sensing modality. Um, the basic idea, uh, well, I'll play the animation in a moment, but the basic idea is that you have a sensor in space that both emits and receives microwave frequency radiation. And um, so it's sending out these signals, like little chirp, they call them chirps, sending out these signals. Um, and when those signals bounce off objects on the ground, it basically it, they reflect back up to the sensor. And um, we use this information, and here I'll play this, and you can see we use information about how those signals are received to learn about the objects on the ground. And so you can see up here, this is simulating a synthetic aperture radar sensor moving through space and sending a signal out. Uh, and those the received signals are coming back to the sensor, and we can use like the overlap in the received signals to build a, a clearer image, basically of what's on the ground. But um, SAR uses uh, principles of Doppler shift and uh, frequency modulation, um, and and some other principles of communication systems to um, distinguish between signals received from different parts of the ground. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now, but I'm happy to answer questions about SAR. Yeah, I'm happy to answer questions about SAR later. One of the one of the key decisions in the design of remote sensing systems is trades um, and trades about resolution. In remote sensing, we talk about four different types of resolution: spectral, spatial, temporal, and radiometric resolution. I've already talked about spectral res spectral spectral uh, sensing a little bit in the sense that you can take this electromagnetic spectrum and break it up into lots of little parts and use those different spectral bands to learn about a material. But basically, the more bands you have, the more clearly you can identify and distinguish between different materials um, or different, different types of objects on the ground. And so um, this is called spectral resolution. Basically, the more bands you have, the higher the spectral resolution is. Um, there's also spatial resolution, which is probably the probably the most familiar to everyone here, and it's the category of resolution that is um, uh, most pertinent to disaster response applications. Um, sp spatial resolution is typically measured in uh, in ground sampling distance or pixel size, um, both of which you can kind of think of as uh, what is the area on the ground that is captured by a given pixel? I have an illustration of this in a few slides. Um, and so 30 meter, you know, 30 meter, meter pixel resolution uh, is capturing, you know, you can think of each of these pixels as 
being a, approximately 30 meters. It's a little bit more um, involved than that, but uh, as opposed to having one meter pixel resolution or sub meter pixel resolution or ground sampling distance. And so the, the lower the number, the higher the spatial resolution. Um, temporal resolution, similarly, uh, we can think of as like, as how frequently um, imagery is collected over a given area. And radiometric resolution is the ability to, dis so temporal resolution allows you to distinguish how something changes over time more, more, more clearly. Radiometric resolution is, um, is a, a, being able to distinguish between the brightness of different objects and different features on the ground. So, um, you know, being able to distinguish between like very bright and very dark versus all the shades of gray in between. So um, in, you know, in satellite remote sensing, and I think through the course of this, or throughout this, this, this challenge, you guys are, are talking about a lot of these different kinds of satellite system trades. I won't go through all of them in detail, but, you know, there are, you have design decisions to make about the payload, um, about the satellite bus, about the constellation, um, ground infrastructure, and then other mission considerations, like how much are we willing to spend on a satellite? How long do we want it to last? Um, what launch vehicles are available, uh, and then how will we manage the end of life for that mission? And all of these, all of these variables, to some extent or another, um, relate to both the resolution trades and the, the the questions of like how useful will this thing be um, to somebody at the end of the day. And so um, I think. I'll, you know, just at a very high level, I think you guys are probably familiar with this process, but satellite remote sensing isn't just about the satellite. It's about satellites, uh, the data they collect, um, the way that they're operated, how that data is transmitted to the ground, and then also how it's processed, analyzed, and disseminated. And when we're talking about emergency management and using satellite remote sensing in disaster response, um, it's really important to understand who the users are. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide, or well, actually, I'm not. Uh, the, the, in addition to sort of the the high level process and architecture of the of a satellite mission, um, there are a lot of environmental considerations and operations that that are important to having a system that functions and that ultimately meets the needs of of stakeholders at the end of the day. Um, and then who who operates each part of this? Uh, each part of the system and each part of the, the satellite remote sensing process um, also makes a difference. And so these are a lot of the things that we think about in like in asking the question, how do we make satellite remote sensing more useful and more applicable during disasters? It isn't just about the satellites and it isn't just about how the data is analyzed, um, but who the people are who are actually performing the, the functions of operating the satellites, collecting the data, analyzing the data, disseminating the data. All of those people are important and so are their business processes. Um, and so when we think about how to, how to choose the right sensor, choose the right sensing platform, um, I always try to bring it back to who are the, who are the end users of this data? What are the decisions that they're making and the actions that they're trying to take? And so for satellite remote sensing and disasters, um, this is not comprehensive, but one of the, uh, one of the outcomes of some of the analysis we've done is identifying, we've identified four groups of stakeholders who often frequently use or would like to be using satellite remote sensing to support their decisions and actions. And those are emergency uh, staff who work in emergency operation centers. Um, so the people who are like at mission control with computers all over the walls, like trying to figure out what's happening on the ground and, and how to deploy resources to um, uh, address needs. And so these folks are performing functions like declaring a disaster. Um, or consolidating and sharing information, deploying resources, issuing public messaging, issuing evacuation orders. We also have disaster survivors who I think are the most important people. Um, and these are folks who are affected by a disaster who are making decisions for themselves about do we evacuate? When do we, when do we go home? What repairs are we going to have to make? Um, and, and where can we get assistance for performing these functions? There's also staff in the field who, uh, again, perform a wide variety of functions, probably most of the things we think about when we think about like disaster response, uh, we think about field staff. Um, and then there are also staff involved in recovery, both at you know, state agencies, local agencies, federal agencies, um, nonprofit organizations, and other kinds of groups 
who are like assessing damage, uh, involved in removing debris, um, selecting places for temporary housing, and uh, in general, you know, doing the hard long work of rebuilding and restoring communities and infrastructure over many years. Across these groups, we identified four common information needs that we think are good candidates for satellite remote sensing to provide. The first question is just straight up, what area was affected? Um, and so some of the products that I showed at the beginning, some of these satellite uh, analyses answer this question of like, what area was affected? Where was the fire? Where was the flood? Um, how widespread is the damage? There is a question about how to get in and out of the impacted area, which routes are navigable, which routes are fastest, where do we need to clear debris or um, conduct emergency repairs on our roads so that we can get in and out of areas to provide assistance to people. There's a question about the severity count and location of damaged structures. Um, so this is thinking like about housing damage. I think I have a few more slides on housing damage. I'm, we'll see how we're doing on time. Um, but the like a lot of different people have a question early on after a disaster happens about how many homes were damaged and whether that damage renders those homes uninhabitable. Um, and, you know, these these groups include people who are making decisions about uh, about where to provide emergency resources. It includes disaster survivors. It includes insurance companies um, and people who are who are providing housing assistance. And so this is a really important question that remote sensing can shed light on. Um, and then the last question is is pretty general, like what else is happening? And emergency managers like to call this situational awareness as the idea that we don't know what all the questions are going to be before a disaster happens. And um, one thing emergency managers like to say is that all disasters are local. Every disaster is different. Um, and it's true, the location and localities affected, the entities and organizations involved in response and recovery change every time. Um, and so having a, a, an overhead view of everything that's going on is really, really valuable for understanding and, and providing context for making the best decisions. And so um, translating these needs, these information needs into data products looks kind of like this. Um, you know, a ha hazard boundary uh, impact, impact data set that is some sort of geospatial product that delineates where a flood or fire or, or, or earthquake occurred. Um, road network, GIS, you know, ge geographic information systems can uh, produce and ingest road network data, um, which can be used for routing and providing uh, recommended routes to crews that are going in and out of an impacted area. Structural damage assessments, um, so kind of house by house or building by building, looking at how severe the damage was. Um, in this rendering, purple is, is destroyed, red is uh, pretty bad damage, yellow is a little bit of damage, and green is, is um, unaffected. Um, and then, and then you know, high resolution overhead optical imagery can provide a lot of detail about where, uh, you know, where we might not have thought to ask questions that, that could be sort of analytically annotated like this. Um, so uh, just to provide, provide a little bit of context on some of the emergency management. Uh, an incident happens, right? Somebody, this is how things typically happen. Somebody goes out into the field with, a, uh, often with a clipboard and um, collects information about what houses were damaged and where and how bad the damage was. Um, that information is collected and consolidated and used to, to create a request, usually for federal assistance, um, which can result in a federal disaster declaration, which the president issues. Um, and then, you know, this enables response and recovery programs to happen. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that we we've found is that this takes like a really long time and it takes much, I don't know, people who work in this know that it takes a long time. Uh, we did some analysis to look at exactly how long um, it takes for these preliminary damage assessments to happen. And, you know, this is sort of motivation for like, we should be using additional data and imagery resources to, to make this assessment. And so some of the pieces of information that imagery can provide are like, where did damage occur? What caused the damage? Was it flood, wind? How severe was it? Right, which road, roads are passable? Um, and so uh, 
you know, imagery can provide this information by, uh, you know, through through both either manual or automated analysis um, to look at where houses are flooded, how bad the damage is to different homes, um, and that kind of thing. Uh, I'm going to move on in the interest of time, but we did we did spend some time quantifying um, the like basically looking at how the severity of damage tracks to different things that you can observe from space. Um, so you can see how much of a roof is missing and the percentage of the roof missing maps to different levels of damage severity. You can look at whether walls are collapsed, whether you know flood water is present. Um, and then there sometimes are other considerations like if a house is completely covered by lava, um, then it's typically destroyed. Uh, and so um, we did the same kind of analysis with roads, looking at actual measurable metrics that provide some information about how passable a road is or whether, you know, what, to what extent repairs might be needed. Um, and so you can look at the, the width of damage, the distribution of damage, right, whether debris or water is obstructing the road and the different sizes of these things basically, you know, track to, can you, can you get a, a 20 foot tractor trailer um, you know, down a road and is it, is it navigable, is it passable? Um, and so what this translates to is we can start then to talk about re like requirements for imagery products and imagery data products. Um, and uh, some of the key categories, I'm gonna talk about the top three of these briefly and I'll, I'll briefly show the others and I'm happy to ask questions. But um, when we talk about like, like this, this kind of comes to the question of what do we, like what does, what what kind of imagery product is good enough? How do we know if imagery is good enough to actually perform some of these functions? And so we did analysis on resolution, um, area coverage, and and timeliness. So for um, spatial resolution, as I mentioned before, ground sample distance or, or pixel size is uh, basically like how we talk about spatial resolution. We can think about there being like a range of useful resolutions. And the, the academic and practitioner literature suggests that anywhere from 25 centimeters all the way up to a meter and a half spatial resolution is good enough for performing emergency management functions. Um, there are varying, uh, <laughs> varying opinions about this. Um, there's also a, like an economics principle that I think is really applicable here uh, that's called monotonicity of preference, which basically means that we always want more of a good thing. So, um, you know, we're always going to say that the 25 centimeter resolution imagery is better and more useful than the meter and a half imagery. But that doesn't really answer the question of what you get for having higher resolution data. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are, there are a couple studies that have been done, um, and I'll share some of our analysis in a second. This was one study uh, from Michael Hodgins' lab at the University of South Carolina, where they actually, they actually took imagery of damaged buildings and um, artificial, or they, you know, uh, they down, down sampled the imagery to make it lower resolution, different resolutions. And then they showed it to a bunch of annotators and looked at, uh, and looked at performance. And they found that a meter imagery uh, was, was good enough from um, kind of, you know, that's where you had like diminishing returns was after a meter spatial resolution. The reason this matters is because the difference between designing a satellite to collect one meter, uh, one meter imagery or 25 centimeter imagery is um, it's a, a pretty significant design variable that has a huge effect on the size of the optics you need and the uh, or the amount of power you need and the size of your satellite bus. So um, another way to think about resolution is is based on what you can see in the data. There is a scale called the National Imagery Interpretability Rating Scale or the NIRS scale which um, has these categories, NIRS five, six, seven, I think it goes all the way up to nine, um, that are roughly correlated with resolution ranges and talk about what you can see in the images. And so for you know, NIRS five scale of 0.7 or 75 centimeters to a meter and a half spatial resolution, you can see lines on the road and fall in utility poles. Um, on the other end of the higher resolution, uh, you know, 20 centimeters to half a meter, um, if you have imagery this good, then you can see like single tiles on a roof. 
And so um, this gives us some sense of like how many more things you could see or distinguish if the resolution of the imagery is higher. We also did some quantitative analysis though, um, really looking at like based on our use cases, how, how, how good does the data need to be? Um, and there's a, you know, the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem is uh, basically like, is, it basically is the theorem, it's from, um, uh, it basically says that you need two observations of a thing um, to establish a pattern or to identify an object. And so in, um, in cryo-electromicroscopy, they have adapted this principle to um, basically uh, understand how many pixels you need to identify an object uniquely. Uh, here's some of the math around it. I thought this, this, this is the article where, this, um, where they published this and it's a, a pretty cool approach for thinking about um, how, to, how to identify uh, how, how good of uh, resolution you need for different tasks. Um, and so we took our, you know, our matrices that we made of different, uh, the different sizes of things for, um, you know, it, it detecting damage to homes and roads and used this principle to look at like, okay, how, how, how much better uh, information can you get by having higher resolution data? Um, and so this is that mapping, right? You can see, you can see big damage with low resolution data and you can see, but you need higher resolution data to see less severe damage. Um, and so, right, this isn't an answer to how good does your resolution need to be, but it does provide some, some sense of what the trade-offs are in this space. Um, and so, you know, we're recommending that like desired resolution would be 25 centimeter spatial resolution, but one meter is acceptable and you wouldn't want anything really lower than a meter and a half for disaster response applications. Um, another, another uh, area coverage is another really important point to consider. Um, if you if you look online at like what satellite imagery companies advertise, uh, they'll talk about how they can have you know six hour tasking turnaround time, like in six hours or less, they can take a picture of your thing and, and deliver that data. But when we're talking about like natural hazards, often affect large areas. This is a map from Hurricane Ida, which was two years ago, uh, or three years ago, I guess almost two and a half, and um, you know, Hurricane Ida affected most of the eastern seaboard. I think 13 states received disaster declarations. And um, so any satellite system that is, you know, designed or intentionally going to be providing data uh, to, to support disaster response and recovery has to capture the whole area that might have been affected, which is a lot of data, especially when we're talking about one meter spatial resolution. I think I have some colleagues who calculated that if you were going to have satellite or to have five meter optical imagery of the whole earth is something like five trillion, five trillion pixels. I mean, it's a lot of data. Um, so there's this question about like, okay, if we're collecting data with satellites, how much area do we actually need to capture for that data to be informative? Um, and so we took a look at this by uh, breaking it down by disaster declaration. So um, when we declare uh, disaster, like when, when the federal government in the United States makes a disaster declaration, which authorizes various programs to be available to the people affected in that area, um, we do this on a county by county basis. So we took some data from FEMA's declaration database and basically looked at how big were the counties affected. So this graph is, is square miles on the x axis and the number of disaster declarations on the y axis. And what we found that was that on average, um, like 17 and a half thousand square miles are affected by disasters. Um, the, the median, which I actually find to be more informative was 9,000, uh, you know, 9,000 square miles. And just to give a sense of, of how big this is, like 10,000 square miles is the size of the state of Massachusetts and 50,000 square miles is the size of the state of Louisiana. Um, so for some of these incidents, we really are talking about, you know, whole states worth of data. Um, and so a satellite system, you know, has to be able to provide, uh, has to be able to cover the whole impacted area um, and provide that data if it's really going to be useful. And the, the third question that we took a real analytic look at is about timeliness and how, like, how, 
how early is imagery actually needed? Um, and I think if emergency managers had it their way, they would be able to see imagery, you know, Im have imagery available immediately after a disaster happens. But um, as I think you all probably know at this point, right, like because of the way satellite orbits progress and it depends on what orbital configuration your satellites are in, it depends on how many satellites you have, um, it can be any number of days before your, your satellite is uh, in view of the impacted area. Um, and so just to, again, to provide some intuition around this, there are really three time periods that are important for um, disaster collections. There's imagery that needs to be collected before a disaster happens so that you know what things look like prior to the incident. And then there's, um, and so this, in, in this case, uh, for pre-incident imagery, having the imagery collected as soon as close to the incident as possible within a couple days is usually adequate um, or a month in advance is really helpful. This is sort of the sweet spot for for pre incident imagery collections. Of course, most of the time we don't know when a disaster is going to happen. So um, we get what we we take what we get. <laughs> uh, but then after a disaster happens, um, having that imagery within two, two to three days is really, really important. Um, after three days, the value of imagery, it's still valuable, it's still useful, but um, by then, most of the time, field crews have been out surveying damage. Uh, we kind of already know how bad the, the incident is. For, for incidents that are very severe, um, imagery remains useful for a longer period. Uh, but right after a disaster happens, there's this information vacuum where nobody knows what's going on. And so overhead imagery can provide invaluable situational awareness during the first 24 to 48 hours. Um, and then finally, repeat collections can sometimes be useful. This is where that idea of temporal resolution comes in. Uh, if you can take imagery, you know, every few months, um, you can you can get a sense of how recovery is progressing. Or in the case of uh, disasters that happen over an extended period of time, um, you can track the how how that how that occurs. Um, I think this is actually the set of use cases that is least well understood and exploited right now. So um, here are recommendations for timeliness as well. Uh, and I'm going to skip the, the rest of these. The one, maybe the one point to, to drive home is that for satellite remote sensing to be really useful in disasters, it has to be provided every time a disaster happens so that emergency managers know how to incorporate that information into their processes and they can uh, rely on that data. Um, and so right now, I think this is this is really the area that one of the areas where a lot of work has to happen of like standardizing these processes um, so that, you know, it, it's part of the um, part of the process. Okay, this is another visualization of kind of all the steps that go into satellite remote sensing. Um, one thing I wanted to make sure to talk about uh, in this presentation is just processing and analysis. And I think this is probably, this is another piece that's quite relevant to you all for, um, for the build a CubeSat challenge. Uh, some of the core, and I know we're kind of running out of time here, so I'm gonna just leave this and you guys can ask questions if you'd like. There are a number of steps that are typically important to complete in turning your um, imagery data into a useful imagery product. Uh, an imagery product would be like a data layer that can, that can be um, viewed or visualized in an online system. So uh, think about like Google Maps or Google Earth. Um, the, the imagery base layers in those systems are imagery products, but they didn't come off the satellites that way. Um, there's a whole set of uh, calibration processes that typically take place. Um, you have to re you know, reduce noise, ad adjust for radiometric differences and weird reflections and that kind of thing. Um, sometimes you have clouds in an image, so uh, taking enough pictures to not have clouds is often important. Um, uh, there's a process called color reconstruction where you, can, you adjust the spectral signatures based on the um, properties of the of the, the camera itself to um, be calibrated. Uh, and then two of the most important ones are orthorectification and georegistration, which I'll, I'll spend a, a moment on. Um, orthorectification is basically making your image so that it appears to be top down at every point. It's a type of image processing. So if your satellite is directly overhead, um, and the earth is curved, you know, the point that's immediately on the ground that's immediately under the satellite will appear to be top down. But a point that's over here at the edge of the image 
will uh, appear to be taken at an angle. Sometimes you'll see the sides of buildings or um, topography will be kind of skewed. And so orthorectification is a, a basically like a geometric processing um, approach to making your image appear to be top down at every point. Georegistration is the <laughs> critical and challenging process of then taking that image and, um, and lining it up so that the points in the image are correlated with latitude and longitude points on the earth. Um, and that can be quite, quite challenging. Mosaicing and tiling finally are you know, taking your, your image and breaking it up into pieces that either will load quickly in a web viewer or can be downloaded and manipulated by an analyst. Um, and finally, to talk a little bit about analysis, uh, three types of analysis that are typically performed on imagery, especially in, in disasters, are change detection, feature extraction, and classification. Feature extraction and classification often go together as like feature classification. Um, but change detection is where you take an, in, an image that, uh, that was collected before an incident and an image that was collected after an incident, and um, you basically subtract them from each other to look at where new things uh, appeared and where existing things disappeared. Um, and so I think traditionally blue are objects that appeared and red are objects that disappeared, although I might, I might have that switched. But uh, typically you would have like a blue-red change detection product sort of like this to show um, which pixels changed. Change detection is is uh, can be complicated to do um, in an automated way, and traditionally has been done by like an analyst looking at looking at pictures. Um, with machine learning and uh, you know uh, new computer vision models, we're getting better at doing this in an automated fashion. In disasters, it's still very difficult um, because sometimes the pictures that we have. Uh, don't line up very well or are taken at different angles or different times of the day. And so all of that creates noise when doing change detection. For feature extraction and classification, this is the process of identifying um, features of interest in your image, either identifying buildings or roads or flooded areas, um, right? And, and basically taking a picture and parsing it into unique objects or unique land features. Classification then is, is the process of identifying what those objects are. And again, machine learning and AI are, are facilitating this. In disasters, classification is extremely difficult. And um, in my opinion, it, it is still done quite, like we haven't, we haven't cracked the code on how to do feature classification very well, partially because there's a comparative dearth of disaster imagery. And there are very few train, like labeled data sets to develop new AI models. Um, that perform well in disasters. You know, like damaged houses look very different from uh, whole houses, and you know, damaged crops look very different from anything else. And all of these things vary greatly depending on the the region and geography. So, um, you know, but these are some of the processes. And so, you know, this is a <laughs> this I hope provides you guys with a like a high level overview of. Um, some of the a lot of the considerations in satellite remote sensing in disasters and and I think hopefully puts your projects into uh, into some context on the um, on Edley uh, I believe your uh, the final project is is live now and so um, the I, I think we wrote it up a little bit differently online but the final project really the goal is to use your satellite to conduct uh, disaster operations. And so um, you can do damage assessments. You could do another kind of disaster function if you'd like, um, you know, identifying floods or uh, or identifying debris. Um, but I think what, uh, what we're hoping you guys will all be able to do with your satellites is to, um, you know, create a scene of pre-incident and post, you know, create a scene and then simulate some sort of incident happening. Um, and then to use pre-incident imagery and post-incident imagery to uh, to learn something and create some information about what happened in your disaster. Um, and so I think with that, this this is the end of my slides. I realize I've talked a little bit longer than I had I had hoped, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and I hope this was helpful and informative to you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie.
Um, I think we have just a few minutes for questions. If anyone wants to ask a question to Katie, either in the Q and A or um, feel free to unmute and ask your question live. I see there were some questions in the Q and A about um, about the project, and uh, I, I, I just just to clarify, my presentation here focused on you know disasters and like the. How, how we're thinking about satellite remote sensing disasters kind of in the world right now. Um, but as as Rebecca and Anch said in the in the Q and A, um, you know, there's no need to for your project to go and like find a real disaster. Um, but the information here is a little bit more of the real world aspect here. So, um, okay, what recommendations do you have in regards to the design process and how the CubeSat is constructed? Rebecca or Anj, that might be for you. Yeah, so we've given you a set of hardware. Uh, it is limited in its capability. Um, we're not asking or wanting you to purchase anything additional. We're asking you to use what you have to come up with a demonstration of a disaster relief mission. Try to find things that you already have in your homes or schools or whatever environment that you're working on your project that you can use to demonstrate a pre and post incident like Katie was saying um, and use your CubeSat hardware to image that pre and post incident and then generate some products from that that you could give to an emergency manager to help them in a disaster scenario. So your, your goal is to use what you have to demonstrate that CONOPS, uh, and hopefully if you work through the subsystem labs, those will help you understand how to use the hardware that you have. If you have any questions about it though, please let us know on Piazza or join our regular office hours with the TAs. Let's see, is everyone's CubeSat going to look different or is it assembled the same way? Everyone has the same hardware, so I'd expect it would look fairly similar, but not identical. Um, there are multiple ways that you can assemble the CubeSat. The part of the project where we expect you to use your creativity and that everyone will have a different solution is how you approach the mission and how you approach demonstrating it. That should look very different for every team. I think we have a question also about the importance of timeliness. Yeah, I can I can take this one. Um, Avanish, I'll read. So I know timeliness is an important factor. How useful would a, sy would a system that works mainly over in the night be? Perhaps to supplement more exact tools used during the day. We're currently looking to detect changes in nighttime lights to detect power outages, which could in turn be a symptom of other issues. Nighttime lights is absolutely a useful indicator in um, in understanding the impacts of a disaster. It so the the nighttime lights. Uh, example that you're talking about is definitely definitely useful. Um, often we use nighttime lights in. Um, I, I've actually I've seen that data used more in uh, like humanitarian crises actually than in like domestic disaster response, and so. Um, Nighttime lights provide like two really important pieces of information. One is where is the power out, um, and so you can the current data that we have um, in space <laughs> provides it's uh, several meter spatial resolution. So you can see like in cities and towns where the power may be out. Um, the other thing it can tell you is where people are establishing like temporary. Uh, um, like establishing camps basically, or, or temporary housing sites, uh, you'll see people like lighting fires and things and that will show up in nighttime lights. Um, with regard to the how that complements uh, imagery collected during the day, um, I think the fusion of those data sets is, I haven't, I actually haven't seen people like fuse the data sets before, um, but it, it certainly complements, uh, you know, the additional information that you, you can get from optical imagery. Another component to think about here is um, I, I spoke a little bit about synthetic aperture radar because that's an active sensing modality. You can use it to like you can you can operate the sensor at night um, or on the 
you know, nighttime side of the, the earth. Um, and it doesn't really matter if it's day or night. So there are some sensing modalities also for which it, the, the time of day doesn't matter. I'll add that Katie and I did some on orbit experiments together with a CubeSat, um, a camera on a CubeSat, and we were able to detect basically nighttime lights in a city. Um, and, and I think that is definitely an area you could pursue with your CubeSats. Okay, thanks for all of the great questions. And thank you so much, Katie, for joining us today and giving us this great overview of remote sensing for disaster relief. My pleasure. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And uh, if anyone has any questions, Catherine. And if you post Peony, on will... Piazza as well, um, if it's a yes. question for Katie, we'll pass it on to her. Yep. Yeah, actually, I guess posting on Piazza is probably, probably yeah. Piazza better, is great because right? then we, we can post the answer for everybody because if you're having the question, probably someone else is too. Great. Thanks everyone for listening. I have a question, Thank you. Katie. Katie, I have a question. I've been trying to pop it in here and, and it doesn't, I mean, I just need to speak to the lead. So I was waiting on you guys to dismiss everybody before I ask, because it has to do with something that all of these young people probably already have, have addressed. Sure. What's your question? Yes. Um, we have been trying to get some, about four or five of our students have been unable to receive their logins to the curriculum. And we've made several, several requests. And so I just need to figure out how to get them their logins. Yeah, could you send us an email to the BWSI underscore BACC at MIT.edu email? Yeah, can you put that in the chat please and I'll grab it out of there. Yeah, one second. All right, thank you. Our mentors have been great. I, I think it's our students first time around. So we may not make everything submit, but I'm gonna make sure they finish it <laughs> so that they'll be ready next year. Oh yeah, that that's, you know, we, we expect everybody's coming in with different levels of experience and that's totally okay. And one of the reasons we have this project be so open-ended is so that you, you can, uh, you know, work with your team to deliver what makes sense for your team. And that might be, um, you know, more manually doing change detection instead of implementing that in code, for example, uh, keeping the system a little bit simpler so that they can show results rather than worrying about making complicated code and hardware. Yeah, and that's I think totally okay. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, excuse me. Are you uh, put this? Yeah, uh, I'm going to put it in the chat right now. Sorry. Got distracted right, talking to you. Our mentors have been great. I think it's our students. And so we just, we told them that they're going to start from scratch and they're going to finish. And uh, even don't worry about, uh, I want them to finish. I don't want them to withdraw. Yeah, we're not going to close the course either. So if it takes, them longer to complete the online course, they are welcome to continue past the, the final event's going to happen when it happens, but yep. they are welcome to continue on and that's totally fine. And I, I would suggest they just submit whatever they have at those deadlines so they can get feedback, uh, yep. but don't feel bad if they haven't completed all of the course content up to that point. That's totally Perfect. fine. But that email that I put in the chat, that's what um, you should, should message us for any issues with accessing Edly. Um, that will get you the best response. Okay. Uh, you will have access to the, the course chat. forever. Yep. Okay. Do you see that in the chat? Yes, I do. Great. I'll send you the names and email of the team and the, uh, the team number and the students that do not have access. Perfect. And that'll be Joel Grimm who's one of our um, leads for BWSI, who helps us administer the Edley course. He'll be able to help you with that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Katie, again.
been great having everybody today. I'm going to go ahead and shut down the Zoom now. Have a good night. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Katie. Thank you.